Welcome. My name is Steve Raudenbush, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Education here at the University of Chicago. And on behalf of the committee and the university, um, I welcome you all to this conference. We're here today to celebrate the life of Hyman Milgram, who graduated from the University of Chicago in 1935 and who died recently at the age of 97. And today we are publicly launching an ambitious new tenure project in his name and based on his general, generous support. Hyman Milgram had a lifetime commitment to fighting discrimination based on religion, race, and ethnicity, and a long-time commitment to equality of opportunity. There's no better way to celebrate his life than to face some stark realities. Educational inequality is large and growing at a time when education is ever more impart, important in the labor market. And we face a continuing national crisis of massive unemployment in our nation's cities. Our project is entitled Successful Pathways from School to Work. It's a search for solutions based on evidence to this national crisis. We seek to ally scholars and practitioners in Chicago and across the nation in a new movement to overcome this continuing crisis. Our movement will be armed, but only with ideas and evidence. The project is off to a rousing start, having uh, already funded uh, 13 faculty projects and six doctoral students. The studies are wide ranging, including studies of early interventions that get young people living in hard pressed communities on track for lifelong success, studies of effective, of effective instruction, studies of how to connect high risk adolescents with the labor market. Hyman Milgram's son, Charles, and his daughter, Paxton Quigley, have played a crucial role in helping us launch our project. And Paxton is here tonight. Pax is going to say a few words, um, but first let me tell you a little bit about Pax. Paxton Quigley resides in Miami and New York. She has a bachelor's from Northwestern and a master's degree in anthropology from the University of Chicago. Her curriculum vitae is uh, quite eclectic. Currently, she's an associate producer of the well-known off-Broadway show, Forbidden Broadway. She's the author of six published books, including the bestseller, Armed and Female. She hosted the Pax and Quigley Empowerment, Empowerment Hour, a radio show, co-hosted uh, a live radio show in Los Angeles. She's appeared on Oprah, Charlie Rose, CBS Evening News, NBC Nightly News, Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, as well as hundreds of radio shows and was profiled on 60 Minutes in the Wall Street Journal. And Paxson was the Director of Community Relations for Playboy Enterprises for years. She's a member of um, a number of important boards and, and uh, um, environmental and uh, cultural organizations. She's a pioneer in the organic foods business and co-owns the country's Sun Organic Food Supermarket in Palo Alto, California. Let's welcome Paxton Quigley. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so proud to be involved in this most wonderful project that my father donated to the University of Chicago. My father was an entrepreneur, and he made a lot of money, although none of us really knew it. Um, he drove, for example, a Mercury Sable car that he never washed. He would always put it outside when it rained. He'd take it out of the garage, put it outside in the rain, and it would get washed. That's the kind of guy he was. He also would go every day, he'd walk almost five miles to McDonald's. And why did he go to McDonald's? Because they had a discount on coffee, a senior discount. <laughs> so you could imagine that if he had done that for so many years, he certainly saved a lot of money, and it obviously is going to the University of Chicago. So if you want to give to University of Chicago, go to McDonald's. <laughs> anyway, um, to be serious now, he was very much involved with the idea of disadvantaged youth getting an education. And early on in the 70s, he even worked with some uh, community leaders, but he was dissatisfied with how they were working at the time. And 
I remember talking with him the year before he died, and he was already giving money to the University of Chicago, and he said, you know, you and your brother will be continuing this, and he said, try in every possible way to make it so that we can get disadvantaged kids out of where they are. And that's really what we're all about. That's what we think about, that's what we want to do. And the Hyman Milgram Supporting Organization, we have a goal that we want to continue to, to grant to various uh, research projects, both, both at the university level as well as the student level. And also, we are looking for innovative projects. We're looking for, for projects that students think that they have a chance to do something with. And we really hope that some of you out there, especially the students out there, will think about somehow writing something that will be able to go ahead and support for you. Because we have to think about the youth, the students at the University of Chicago making a difference and coming up. We're going to be having a, a wonderful symposia right now, and I hope you enjoy it and learn something. And I really want to thank all of you for being here this afternoon, taking time out on one of the most beautiful days that Chicago has had in a long time. And uh, again, thank you very much. Thanks, Pax, for your inspiration and your support. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the drama that you are about to witness and actually participate in. It's a play in three acts. In the first act, we'll consider the root causes of the crisis fa facing urban youth. We want people to understand the broad historical forces that have eliminated so many jobs, intensified racial and social class segregation, and produced severe concentrated disadvantage that has taken a toll on families and schools. No one is better able to explain the root causes than William Julius Wilson, our keynote speaker. In the second act, we'll talk about the proposition that school improvement can help overcome the crisis that Professor Wilson describes. For two, our, act two of our drama, we have a remarkable panel of two top researchers, James Heckman and Charles Payne, and two leading practitioners, Shane Evans and Elizabeth Kirby, who will, who will reflect on Professor Wilson's remarks and consider whether, to what extent, and how improving education can help overcome this crisis. In the third act of our play, you, the audience, will take the lead role in questions and answers. We want to hear your thoughts about the root causes of the crisis and the prospects of educational improvement for helping us overcome it. And now let me introduce our keynote speaker. William Julius Wilson is the Lewis P. and Linda L. Geyser University Professor at Harvard University. He's one of the foremost sociologists in the, of our time. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Sciences, the National Ed and the National Academy of Education. He's received 45 honorary degrees from some of the most prestigious universities in the world. And in 1998, he received the National Medal of Science, the highest scientific honor in the United States. For 23 years, William Julius Wilson was here at the University of Chicago. And during that time, he wrote The Truly Disadvantaged. This book changed the way we think about racial and social class segregation in US cities and the consequences for families, schools, and children. It's one of the most influential books in the history of sociology. He has just published a new edition of that book. And Professor Wilson will now tell us about The Truly Disadvantaged Revised Let's welcome back to Chicago, Professor William Julius Wilson. It's a great pleasure to return to the University of Chicago, where I spent so many happy uh, and productive years. And it's an honor, really an honor, 
to address this august body and be a part of the celebration to launch the Committee on Education's initiatives on successful pathways from school to work. Recognize its inaugural cohort of grantees and honor the late Hyman Milgram, whose large bequests made all of this possible. Now, my talk this afternoon uh, comes a year and a few months after the 25th anniversary publication of my book, The Truly Disadvantaged. However, the economic processes emphasized in the book have continued. The loss of manufacturing jobs, the movement of jobs from cities to suburbs and overseas, and even greater internationalization of the economy, especially through trade liberalization facilitated by free trade agreements in the 1990s. Moreover, given the expansion of low-wage jobs lacking fringe benefits and the polarization between high-wage and low-wage occupations, higher education is even more critical for social advancement in the labor market today. Furthermore, the adverse effects of deindustrialization on inner city black employment continue to be a major problem. By and large, the conditions described in the truly disadvantaged are not qualitatively different more than 25 years later, even though when I wrote the book, urban conditions had been in decline for roughly 50 years, that is since the Early, or for roughly 15 years, I should say, that is since the early 1970s. There are still major racial differences in concentrated poverty. Although the country experienced dramatic declines in concentrated poverty during the economic boom of the 1990s, including declines in urban black neighborhoods since 2000, there has been a substantial increase in high poverty neighborhoods. The problems of joblessness have continued and have even gotten worse for low-skilled blacks. The racial employment disparities have persisted. The black-white unemployment ratio seemed essentially fixed at 2.0 or greater, which means that even through economic upturns and downturns, the black unemployment rate has been at least twice that of the white unemployment rate, although during the recent economic crisis, the rate dipped below 2.0 from December 2009 to March 2010 because of the sharp increase in joblessness among whites. There have also been some important changes that should be noted. There is greater class polarization among African Americans. The outmigration of middle class blacks from the inner city continues, but more have moved to the suburbs, including suburban black neighborhoods. And a growing number of poor blacks now live in the suburbs rather than the cities, many in older inner ring suburbs that feature poverty rates approximating those in the inner cities. Immigration has been very consequential in reshaping cities and urban labor markets, especially low-wage low labor markets. Incarceration has sharply increased in the more than 25 years since The Truly Disadvantaged was published and has had profound consequences for the urban black poor. There is, of course, the Great Recession and its aftermath, including the current period of long-term joblessness. These changes notwithstanding, 
The basic arguments in the truly disadvantaged are as relevant and important today as they were when it was published, and the book created a paradigm that led to hundreds of empirical studies across social science disciplines. In response to my arguments, particularly those dealing with the causes and effects of increased concentrated poverty. These include studies on neighborhood effects, economic restructuring and spatial mismatch, social isolation and concentration effects, and the male marriageable pool hypothesis. Today, I would like to briefly discuss some of the important research on neighborhood effects, a topic that has received a good deal of attention from scholars across social science disciplines. The concept of neighborhood effects refers to the impact of various social, cultural, and demographic neighborhood conditions on the residents. And the research on neighborhood effects suggests that concentrated neighborhood poverty increases the likelihood of social isolation from mainstream institutions, joblessness, dropping out of school, lower educational achievement, involvement in crime, unsuccessful behavioral development and delinquency among adolescents, non-marital childbirth, and unsuccessful family management. In general, the research reveals that concentrated neighborhood poverty adversely affects one's chances in life beginning in infancy and lasting well into adulthood. However, some scholars have been concerned that many of these studies reach conclusions about neighborhood effects based on data that do not address the problem of self-selection bias, a term used by social scientists to describe the effect of people grouping themselves together based on common characteristics. These scholars argue that the effects we attribute to poor neighborhoods may instead be caused by the characteristics of families and individuals who end up living there. In other words, they feel that disadvantaged neighborhoods might not be the cause of poor outcomes, but rather that families with the weakest job-related skills, with the lowest awareness of and concern for the effects of the local environment on their children's social development, with attitudes that hinder social mobility, and with the most burdensome personal problems, are simply more likely to live in these types of neighborhoods. For example, as the economists John Quigley and Stephen Raphael pointed out, those concerned about self-selection bias would very likely conclude that individuals with the weakest job-related skills have chosen to locate in areas where employment access is low, for example, inner city ghetto neighborhoods, simply because monthly rents are lower in these areas. Now, the initial concern about self-selection bias can be attributed to two widely cited and influential papers by Christopher Jinks and Susan Mayer in 1988 and 1990, which critically reviewed the then published literature on the effects of living in poor neighborhoods. Indeed, following the publication of the Jinx and Mayer papers, some scholars argued that neighborhood effects disappear when researchers use appropriate statistical techniques to account for self-selection bias. However, 
In addition to their criticism of the failure of cross-sectional studies to adequately address the problem of self-selection bias, there were two other important issues that Jinks and Mayer raised in highlighting the shortcomings of these studies. First of all, at the time Jinks and Mayer wrote their papers, sophisticated longitudinal research on neighborhood effects had yet to be published. Jinks and Mayer appropriately pointed out that the studies they reviewed ignored the issue of change. Quote, if neighborhood effects accumulate slowly, unquote, they state, quote, measuring neighborhood characteristics at a single point in time can lead to serious measurement error, unquote. And a way to address this problem empirically, they maintained, is to conduct controlled experiments. Secondly, Jinks and Mayer pointed out that a number of the cross-sectional studies they reviewed, including those that did not reveal the presence of neighborhood effects, use empirical measures of neighborhood variables that were not theoretically based and were therefore unable to identify causality. However, since the publication of the papers by Jenks and Mayer, important studies have emerged that either feature controlled experiments or highlight longitudinal research and theoretically driven data collection. And I would like to discuss these studies briefly and then revisit the question that Jenks and Mayer originally raised about the power of neighborhood effects. Now, when one talks about controlled experiments to gauge neighborhood effects, one immediately thinks of the moving to opportunity MTO housing studies. The MTO experiment, a housing pilot program undertaken by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development between 1994 and 1998, was framed as a test of the arguments presented in my book, The Truly Disadvantaged, that neighborhoods really matter in the lives of poor individuals. And HUD's MTO demonstration program conducted a lottery that awarded housing vouchers to families living in public housing developments in high poverty neighborhoods in five cities, Boston, Baltimore, Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York. Over 4,600 families entered the lottery, thus indicating their desire to move and were randomly assigned to one of three groups. One was awarded housing vouchers that could be used to rent in the private market in any area. One was awarded housing vouchers that were restricted to private rentals in low poverty neighborhoods. And one did not receive either voucher in the lottery and was therefore treated as a control group to be compared with the other two groups. The MTO interim evaluation studies were considered superior to other research on neighborhood effects because they were based on data from a randomized experimental design that eliminated the self-selection bias that, quote, had been made, made it difficult to clearly determine the association between living in poor neighborhoods and individual outcomes, unquote. This is from uh, one of the studies on the MTO experiment. In other words, by comparing randomly selected groups with the same socioeconomic characteristics, those who receive vouchers, which enabled them to move, the experimental group, and those that did not receive vouchers, the control group, the MTO studies effectively removed individual self-selection as an explanation of the findings. The reports and publications on the interim evaluation, which was 
finalized in 2003, the evaluation finalized in 2003, provided mixed evidence for neighborhood effects when comparing the group whose MTO vouchers were restricted to low poverty areas with a group that did not receive vouchers. On the one hand, five-year period following random assignment, the MTO movers who relocated to low poverty areas were, were more likely to experience improvements in mental health and less likely to be obese. And girls experienced a significant reduction in risky behavior, that is, drinking, taking drugs, engaging in sex, and so on. On the other hand, research investigators found no evidence of an impact on employment rates and earnings and only, or, or of any marked improvement in the educational or physical health outcomes of children and young men. And these mixed results led some, including reporters, to question whether there really are enduring negative effects of living, living in poor, segregated neighborhoods, and they seem to reinforce the view among some scholars that when studies effectively control for self-selection bias, neighborhood effects are weak or disappear. But one of the criticisms of the MTO interim evaluations is that they really did not address the problem of the long term effects of living in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. However, in the most recent study of the effects of the MTO, the study published in a journal of science in the fall of 2012, the researchers were able to gauge the longer term effects, 10 to 15 years of moving from high poverty to lower poverty neighborhoods. And these effects included significantly improved mental health and subjective well-being, that is, happiness. In fact, the findings were quite robust and provide rigorous scientific evidence for the assumptions that many of us have made about the effects of living in distressed neighborhoods, neighborhoods with high violent crime rates and other rates of social dislocation on mental health and subjective well-being. Indeed, many of the voucher holders express feelings of relief because of their move to less distressed neighborhoods. However, the researchers also found that although the residents perceived their new neighborhood on average to be safer, moving to these neighborhoods did not significantly affect economic self-sufficiency. For example, employment and welfare receipt. A finding that once again raises questions about the ultimate power of neighborhood effects. This finding was not really surprising to those of us familiar with the design of the MTO experiment. Although the research on the MTO experiment is rigorous, there are serious issues with the design of the experiment that limit the extent to which one can generalize about neighborhood effects on issues such as economic self-sufficiency. First of all, many MTO movers who experience difficulties in moving and obtaining apartments in areas of low, lower poverty are relocated to neighborhoods that were not significantly different from the ones they left, not so much in terms of uh, income, but race. For example, three-fifths of MTO families entered highly segregated black neighborhoods. And such neighborhoods tend to be considerably less advantaged than integrated areas. Harvard sociologist Robert Sampson analyzed the neighborhood attainment of all Chicago MTO families and found that after approximately seven years, although the voucher winners resided in neighborhoods with poverty rates somewhat lower than the neighborhoods of control families, both groups clustered in segregated black neighborhoods 
that were still considerably poorer than what an overwhelming majority of Americans will experience, neighborhoods with poverty rates of 30%. Furthermore, as pointed out by the economists John Quigley and Stephen Raphael, the experiment did not improve accessibility to employment opportunities for MTO movers because their new neighborhoods were no closer to areas of employment growth. And Lawrence Katz, the Harvard economist and one of the co-authors of the article in Science, told the New York Times that, quote, the preference for educated workers in this country was so strong that changing neighborhoods did not do much to improve job op options for the participants who were mostly African-American women without college education, unquote. And finally, the adults who entered the program had been exposed all their lives to the effects of severely concentrated disadvantage. And no matter how long they are followed in their new neighborhoods, the effects of those earlier years are not fully erased. So for all these reasons, their new neighborhoods were highly unlikely to result in significant improvements in economic self-sufficiency despite being safer and less distressed. However, the MTO experiment, although quite rigorous, is not the most ideal research design to capture the long-term cumulative effects of concentrated poverty, especially concentrated poverty in racially segregated neighborhoods. And I would therefore like to briefly focus briefly on several important recent longitudinal studies that were designed to measure the cumulative effects of living in high poverty and segregated neighborhoods. I begin with the research of Patrick Sharkey, as presented in his recent book, Stuck in Place, Urban Neighborhoods and the End of Progress Toward Racial Equality, which was published by the University of Chicago Press last year. Analyzing data from the panel study of income dynamics with methods that measure intergenerational economic mobility, Sharkey demonstrated the importance of gauging the longer term effects of living in poor neighborhoods when considering racial differences. He states, quote, when white families live in a poor neighborhood, they typically do so for only one generation. In black American families, neighborhood poverty is commonly multi-generational, unquote. Sharkey also found that since the 1970s, a majority of black families have resided in the poorest quarter of neighborhoods in consecutive generations, compared to only 7% of white families, and that, quote, 72% of black adults living in today's urban ghettos, neighborhoods that are majority black and among the poorest quarter of all American neighborhoods, neighborhoods were raised by parents who also lived in a ghetto a generation earlier. In short, Sharkey states, and I quote, the problem of the urban ghetto is not simply that it has persisted over time, but that the same families have experienced the disadvantages associated with life in the ghetto over multiple generations, unquote. And this problem can be particularly severe for children. Analyzing data from a special supplement of the PSID, which includes a set of questions asked of children, Sharkey was able to examine how the development outcome of children differ depending on the neighborhood environment history of their families. He found that children whose families live in disadvantaged neighborhoods over multiple generations show developmental outcomes that are substantially worse 
than children whose families reside in poor neighborhoods in a single generation, even after he took into account other family factors that might affect children's development. We should also consider another important and related study on children's development that Sharkey co-authored with Robert Sampson and Steve Roddenbush, which examined the durable effects of concentrated poverty on black children's verbal ability. And they studied a representative sample of 750 African-American children ages 6 to 12 who were growing up in the city of Chicago in 1995 and followed them for up to seven years. The children were given a reading examination and vocabulary test at three different periods. And their study shows, and I quote, that residing in a severely disadvantaged neighborhood cumulatively impedes the development of academically relevant verbal ability in children, unquote. Children's verbal ability certainly has consequences for school performances, including the completion of high school. Jeffrey Watke, David Harding, and Felix Elwert's important recent study use the panel study of income dynamics to examine the effects of long-term exposure to disadvantaged neighborhoods and high school graduation. They tracked 4,154 children by measuring their neighborhood context once each year from age one to 17 and found that continuous exposure to disadvantaged neighborhoods, that is neighborhoods featuring high rates of poverty, unemployment, single parent households and welfare receipt, as well as few well-educated adults throughout, quote, the entire childhood life course has a devastating impact on the chances of graduating from high school, unquote. Now, I want to say that uh, each of these uh, longitudinal studies was guided by theoretical arguments. However, perhaps the study that most dramatically addresses Jinx and Mayer's concerns that studies of neighborhood effects should include empirical measures of neighborhood variables that are theoretically based is Robert Sampson's recent Pub, recently published book, Great American City, Chicago, and the Enduring Neighborhood Effect. Now, Samson is a quantitative social scientist who understands the logic of scientific inquiry and therefore the importance of integrating the structure of explanation, the meaning and significance of concepts, and the nature of evidence. And Samson's, uh, Samson's research, empirical measures of concepts, and analysis of data are theoretically motivated. And he fully exploits his very rich data sets by taking, as he puts it, a pluralistic stance on the nature of evidence to assess causation. And his findings flow mainly from a comprehensive research endeavor called the Project on Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods. And using the iconic city of Chicago as a laboratory, this project collected longitudinal data on children, families, and neighborhoods. It is one of the most ambitious and creative research projects in the history of social science inquiry. And Samson analyzed how the mechanisms of social causality are shaped by the integration of individual neighborhood and structural dynamics. In the process, he demonstrates the powerful effects of ecologically concentrated disadvantaged areas such as the inner city ghetto on both individual outcomes and rates of social behavior across neighborhoods, including poverty, joblessness, single parent families with children, verbal ability, violence, incarceration, and collective efficacy. And he shows how these effects are magnified by racial segregation. 
Now, all of the studies I have reviewed following the publication of the Jinx and Mayer papers clearly reveal the importance of neighborhoods on social outcomes. And I hasten to point out that these are the kinds of studies that Jinx and Mayer actually called for in 1990. And I suspect that if these studies had existed at the time they wrote their papers, is Susan Mayer in the audience by any chance? OK. But I suspect, <laughs> but this, I'm, this, all right. This is a positive statement. I suspect that if, if these studies had existed at the time they wrote their papers, they would have obviously had a different view of the power of neighborhood effects. Finally, let me end. I should emphasize that the two books I have highlighted in this presentation, Sharkey Stuck in Place and Samson's Great American City, each suggest thoughtful policy interventions that flow from their theoretical arguments and empirical findings. And since both our authors recognize the limitations of a policy to move large numbers of families out of the ghetto to combat concentrated poverty, given the political realities of urban America, their proposed interventions highlight the importance of a place-based or community-level perspective and because of time constraints, let me just focus specifically and briefly on Samson's proposals. Based on the theoretical arguments and empirical findings in his book, Great American City, Samson advocates a comprehensive approach to policy interventions for distressed areas of the city. Instead of moving people out of troubled neighborhoods, he makes the case for community level interventions, as well as holistic policy interventions that recognize the important interconnected social fabric of neighborhoods in American cities. And consistent with the theory and research of Great American City, this policy initiative would include a focus on strategies to integrate public safety Intervention, such as regular meetings of local police and residents to co-identify problems with broader non-crime policies that address the mediating social processes of social organization, such as opportunities to enhance citizen participation and mobilization. This initiative would also include other theoretically relevant projects that are inextricably linked to neighborhood level dynamics, such as community economic development and citywide or metropolitan programs of mixed income housing that are connected with the dynamics of neighborhood migration. And all of these policy proposals are consistent with Samson's focus on how government action, ranging from zoning decisions to interconnected housing and school policies, affect concentrated poverty, residential segregation, neighborhood stability, and most recently, home foreclosures. And Samson argues that given the historical evidence that community structures are highly patterned, policies focusing on community level interventions and based on research knowledge about the mechanisms of urban change are more feasible and indeed more cost effective over the long term than targeting individuals. And for all of these reasons, he sees the need to broaden our perspective of policy evaluation, which tends to focus almost exclusively on individual actions. And since me meaningful change depends on understanding the impact of ongoing neighborhood dynamics and social structures, these social processes should be an essential part of any program of evaluation. And Samson contends that there is no intrinsic reason why social policy cannot address the realities of individual choice while, in the, while intervening at the scale of the community and citywide social connections. And the only thing that Sharkey adds in his policy recommendations 
which Samson does not highlight, is that any place-based program should take into consideration the important research of James Heckman, the University of Chicago economist who's on our panel. And Heckman's research reveals the importance of investments early in child, children's lives, even before they are eligible for universal schooling. The effects that emerge when children's lives begin in nurturing and enriching environments can be cumulative. And early childhood investments are, a feature, are featured in a program that both Sharkey and Samson discussed in elaborating their place-based recommendations, Jeffrey Canada's Harlem Children's Zone. Now, I suggest the broad-based interventions outlined by Samson and Sharkey with few illusions that they are feasible in the current political climate. But it is important to think seriously about the kinds of projects we should discuss when a more favorable political environment does emerge. And I maintain that the thoughtful interventions, including the community level interventions proposed by Robert Sampson and Patrick Sharkey, should be a part of this discussion. Thank you for being so attentive. <laughs>